Amen. I spent some time wondering what I was going to teach on, and I thought, well, maybe we would continue, but I knew we kind of were at a, not the end, I mean, you can keep going forever with Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and 3 and beyond. But as I was meditating on it and thinking about it, the word compromise came. And I thought, okay, there's not much about compromise in the Bible, I think. So then I assumed God was talking to me. So then I started spending my time wondering, okay, Holy Spirit, show me any areas where I'm compromising. And so then from there I went, what am I going to teach? And again, the word compromise came. So I looked up the meaning of compromise, and it's settled by agreement with mutual concessions. Then I was sure I was not supposed to be teaching on that. And then, as I continued, I realized that today, in the body of Christ, that is a problem. That we are agreeing with the world and making concessions. It's as when we do this, it, one of the reasons is we want to be relevant. We've tried to often explain spiritual things in the natural. And we have taken things in the Bible saying, well, that was said to that particular culture. But we're relevant. That's not relevant to us today. And one of the things I was reading, a book by Brother Greg Moore, Flowing in the Supernatural. And he has um, a chapter in there on should women be in the ministry. So I was reading some of it, and then I noticed the heading of that chapter, and I thought, I better go there. So I read that, and I'm not going to get into what he all said, but we have taken that wrong where he has said about women being in ministry, and so we have now claimed that it was a cultural thing, and that the reason was that the women were here, and the men were here, and they were yelling back and forth, and the women were uneducated, and all the rest of it. And he said, that is wrong. And he gave the exact reason, which can be in another service. But he says, if we ever take the word of God and say that's what they meant and that was referring to that culture, that time, he says, what other scriptures are we going to come across and take out and say they're not relevant today? And the Lord said, Arlene, that's compromise. We compromise when we're ignorant of the word. And we don't allow the Holy Spirit to teach us. For instance, there's that scripture in Corinthians that says, I has not seen, neither ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things God has stored up for us. And there's scriptures, the ways of God are beyond figuring out. Who can know the mind of the Lord? Who can, and it goes on, and so people say, We'll never know what God's going to do. One day he's going to do this, and one day he's going to do that, and some days he heals, and some days he doesn't, and he wants to prosper some today, but tomorrow he might take it all away. Because we've taken a little scripture and tried to figure it out in the natural. And that scripture, and we can go to it, it's in Corinthians, but it says that we speak forth mysteries. He's hidden all these things up for us. That's why we have Holy Spirit to reveal the word to us so we don't try and figure it out ourselves. One thing I've done, generally speaking, when I run across a scripture, I always try and find a couple of other references, a couple of other places out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. But another couple of scriptures... I read it in context, and if I still don't understand it, I put it aside. You can write down that scripture, and later he'll show you, Holy Spirit will show you. But never, ever 
try and figure out the word of God with your natural way of thinking. Because it says the natural man receives not the things of the spirit of God, for they are spiritually discerned. And that's why we have Holy Spirit. But when we don't understand that, we end up compromising, and then we can be deceived. What, another area where we compromise, we have our own desires. And many years ago, David and I came across, he came across one scripture in, his was in Corinthians, this was before we heard Kenneth Copeland talk on it, but to know, owe no man anything but to love them. And I came across the one in Corinthians, Second Corinthians, where he gives seed to the sower and bread for eating, and that you will require, the Amplified says, no outside aid or help. We had a business. What did we do? We went into debt. We were totally debt free. We had a house that doubled in price, all the rest of it. God worked it out. We could be debt free. But we leaned to our own understanding. Somebody told us in business, you cannot be debt free. Now, I'm not telling anybody else to be debt free, but that's what the Lord had spoken to us, and we compromised. We allowed somebody else to tell us, and we went through some of the hardest financial time we ever have. When you're in disobedience, you cannot expect the blessing of God manifesting. We're blessed already. But you cannot go opposite of what the word of God tells you. You cannot compromise and walk in victory. It is impossible. Totally impossible. Now, like I said, I'm not telling anybody else to be debt free. That was a word that God showed us. David at one time, myself at another time, two different scriptures. And it was a decision we made and we broke. When you make a decision, don't go back on it. But make sure your decision is based on the word of God. Amen. Amen? That was our desire. We desired what going into debt would bring us. And we rationalized. We rationalized. You see... I always wanted to live on an acreage so we could buy this acreage. But if we bought this acreage, we also thought we should start another store to bring more income so we could give more to the gospel. I mean, that is dumb to the nth degree. I mean, you go into debt, all the stuff you pay interest on, there's a whole lot you could give into the gospel. Anyway, that was our desire. God didn't put that in our heart. But yet, we were meditating in the word, we were studying the word, we, are, are, we sought after God. He put something, his desire in our heart, and part of that desire was go to Ramah. Instead, we went into debt and opened another sporting goods store. A couple years later, we lost it all. We were givers, we were tithers. But let me tell you, compromise is a thief. It'll kill you. The minute you compromise God's word, you're done. Until you repent. Until you repent. So that's way behind us. But we could have sat there and cried saying, look, we're tithers, we're givers, we're this, we're that, we're this, we're that. So what? But how, praise God for the word and Holy Spirit. He led us out of there, directed us, and we came out. But it wasn't overnight because, and this is part of the daily messages, and we'll probably teach on it again here. We've done it before. But it took time, according to Mark chapter 4. Thorns and thistles and the lust of other things. Oh, I don't want to say I lust other things. Are you kidding me? We lusted for another store and for this house on the acreage. You say, oh no. Oh yes, it was lust because it wasn't God's plan. And we went into debt for it. And it took time to pull those thorns out so the word of God could once again produce. 
you put it in, it's got to be taken out. But you know what? Some of those weeds, like a dandelion and thistle, are really hard to get rid of. And backing on, we back onto this open space, and the city or whosoever has to look after it. And at one time it was nice grass, but you look at it now, there's more dandelions than anything else. And they don't cut it regularly. And so next thing you know, it's a beautiful yellow color. I think maybe that's why I dislike yellow. Reminds me of dandelions. And there's this beautiful yellow color. They still don't cut it. And then, what do you know? It goes to seed. And then a wind comes. And once the wind blows it all into my yard, then they cut it. And guess what those seeds do? Every seed produces after its own kind. And that's what happens to your heart when we put stuff in that isn't the Word of God. And it takes time to get rid of those. And it happened to us because we compromised. And it never works. And that was our desire, not God's desire. Another thing that causes compromise is comparing yourself among yourself. There was this one person I know, they said, well, they figured they're going to go to heaven. Why? Because they were better than these other people that did all this other stuff. So they didn't need Jesus, really, because they were so good. They compared themselves amongst themselves. It's not wise. The only thing you can compare yourself to is Jesus. Is Jesus. That's it. Not what the world is doing. Not what the world is saying okay. And in the last teachings where we said Jesus is the way, the truth. No truth outside of Jesus. Churches, supposed Christian churches, have embraced the woke agenda. We're to hate sin. God loves the sinner. Jesus died for him. We've got the word. We've got the way of escape for him. But he hates sin, and we're to hate sin to such a degree that we won't do it. Amen? Amen. So we, let's look at Hebrews 13, 8 to 9, please. Hebrews 13, 8 to 9. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, I want you to so realize he doesn't change, and that word is not going to change. And what it said yesterday, it says today, and it'll say tomorrow. So don't try and change it and say, well, it was for that culture, or for that time dispensation, but this is different. Next. Be carried not about with divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. When we realize that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and Jesus and his word are one, so the word is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we won't be carried about with strange doctrines. We won't embrace the woke theories. When considering what our leaders are saying by the Spirit of God, and you've got to do this, no matter who comes to this church to preach, and if it's me, you must do it. I can say I'm saying something by the Spirit of God, but you must apply this test. Is it the same that Jesus said yesterday? He's saying it today. If I'm saying something different, then it's not God. You test it out. It's vital. Don't just listen to what somebody else is saying. Find out what the Spirit of God is saying and have it backed up by the Word. It'll keep us out of trouble. It'll keep us away from strange doctrines. Strange doctrines aren't new today. They've been around for years. They were there trying to corrupt the early church. And what keeps us 
from being carried about with strange doctrines, one thing is the grace of God. Knowing that by grace you're saved, by faith, not of works. When you start hearing, you have to do something in order for God to do something, you're in error. And that's the doctrine of devils. We do things because of what Jesus did for us. Not to get Jesus to do something for us. And it's hugely different. Amen. And then when you realize that, you won't be manipulated. By strange doctrines and one way some people some pastors some churches some ministries some whosoever's try and manipulate you with giving putting pressure on you and that your giving will save you or you have to give in order to get blessed let me tell you you give because you are blessed you give because you are blessed. Amen. You give because you got the giver living on the inside of you. But when there's pressure and you're told you have to give to get God to do something, you're an error. No matter whenever you hear, I have got to do something to get God to do something, it's error because God has already completed everything through Jesus' finished works. And by faith, we tap into that. That'll keep us from running after strange doctrines and gods, doing strange things. So I mentioned this scripture. Let's look at it, Ephesians 2.8. Ephesians 2.8. For by grace are you saved. Grace. Grace and truth came by Jesus. For by Jesus, for by the word are you saved through faith. That's God's faith. We didn't have enough faith to even know we needed a savior. Until we heard the gospel, then we realized we needed Jesus. Unless a man be drawn by the Holy Spirit, you can't come to God. You need Holy Spirit to draw you. But God's planted that need of Jesus on the inside of everyone. And that grace, what Jesus did for us, you access through the faith of Jesus. Galatians 2.20, we live by the faith of Jesus. And that not of yourself. Neither of those are of yourself. It's a gift of God. And you might think, well, you've, Pastor Arlene, you have said that scripture beyond many times. It's vital for us to realize that every good thing we have is because of Jesus. Amen. When we realize our prosperity and our healing is because of Jesus, we won't be struggling wanting to know what I have to do to get God to heal me. We will know that that healing power is on the inside of us already. No compromise. No compromise. Be very, very diligent with yourself on what you're listening to. Holy Spirit's in you. And if you're listening to something and it's not quite lines up, just a little... Don't, don't stay there. Now that's just not things of the, of the realm of the spirit and false doctrines. A movie... Sports, and I said sports because not the sport itself so much unless the sport becomes a god and you have to watch, put that above God. But some of the commercials on sporting events that children watch are, are not even for my eyes. So don't watch them. You've got a button to change stations. And if you don't have a button, we used to not have a button back when. You, you'd have to turn it off. And I remember Timon liked to watch the Oilers, and it was on once a week or whenever. 
Now, if there was a fight, now that's part of hockey, but if there was a fight, I'd say, turn it off. So I'd turn the TV off. You're not watching fighting. No commercials, no fighting. Well, then, those days, the TV we had took a while to fire back up. <laughs> now he's missed a whole lot of play in between time for this thing to get fired up. So Timon says, Mom, we can't do this. I said, you're not watching that. He says, I know what to do. He says, so that, that you know, Jody and Brent, and you don't have to see it. He says, I will stand in front of it. I'll cover the TV so we can't see it. And he says, you can turn the sound down even so we don't hear it. But as soon as it's over, we can just turn, flip everything back and I'll move out of the way. That way we won't miss anything. Mom, could we please do that? That boy could talk me into most anything, and I don't know. Not good, not good. The other two thought he was my favorite. Well, he was just my favorite in those kind of things. The others were my favorite in other things. But there's things we shouldn't watch. We just shouldn't watch. And it's getting worse and worse that even now, during a sporting event, there were lesbians and stuff doing the commercials. People of God, be aware what you're seeing. Anytime you have the opportunity to help a homosexual, a lesbian, whatever they are, we have the answer. It's the word of God. They've been deceived. The word will change it. They have to understand that's not the way God created them. They're deceived. But we do not embrace the sin ever. Amen? Because that is compromise. And I know there's churches that are now ordaining homosexuals, but Living Word Christian Center never will. Amen. And it's in our bylaws. Compromise. Compromise. This is something we have to ask ourselves. Am I compromising? Am I settling something by a mutual concession? Now, I understand this is talking, I am totally talking about the Word of God. I am not talking about a relationship or friendship or even, like, I compromised with Timon, okay? I didn't turn the TV off. He stood in front of it. Okay, so we couldn't see it. The point was, so we didn't see it, but there was a compromise of me not turning it off. That wasn't against the word of God. So in any relationship, at school, don't accept everything you're being taught. Don't compromise. Don't compromise. Parents, don't compromise. So we're talking about this no compromise regarding the word of God. Somebody says it's blue and I think it's purple. Who cares? That's not the word. Mind you, blue and purple could be similar. All right. James chapter 4. We're going through this no compromise. James chapter 4. Starting with verse 4. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. I find this interesting. He's not saying you adulterers and adulteresses, you're married and you're having sex outside of marriage. He's saying if you have friendship with the world, you're an adulterer or an adulteress. Interesting. Interesting. That's how God looks at us being friends with the world. Now a friend is somebody you're in agreement with. We are in the world, not of the world, and we're to take every opportunity to share the gospel and to love people. But we're not to compromise and do what they do and go where they go under the guise of I'm going to be a witness. Your witness is not going to those places doing those things. 
If you're doing what they're doing, you're not a witness of Jesus Christ. Frat you're fraternizing with the enemy. You might think you're being a witness to those people, but you're actually being a friend of Satan. This is serious today because I know there's a great awakening. People are hearing the gospel, the good news. And I think one of the big hindrances today is the church of Jesus Christ that's lukewarm, that's embracing all of these people, that's embracing all of these woke ideas. How can you be an example of righteousness when you're doing and being where they are? We've got the answer, people. Amen. They need the answer. They want the truth. They don't want you sitting in the bar beside them. So what? You might, they might be having whatever, and you might be just having water. That's not the point unless you have specifically heard from Holy Spirit to go there because there's a person there for you to witness to. But if you have a friend that wants you to go there, that person, if they're of the world, should not be your friend. They can be an acquaintance that you minister to the word to. But you don't go where they go. Because if you're the same as them, if you do the same as them, look the same as them, talk the same as them, what witness are you? It says to be witnesses and lay hands on the sick and cast out devils. But the church of Jesus Christ has compromised. And they've lost its power. They've lost the power. Oh, I shouldn't say they've lost it. Of course, if you're born again, spirit, it's in you. But you've just blocked it. Not let it flow. Now, I know we have family members that are not saved. And at no time am I saying cut off every family member. Not invite them into your home. Or go into their home, their family but you still don't embrace what they're doing. You don't embrace what they're doing. And they have to know you're different. And it's amazing, they'll know you're different, but it's amazing how they might seemingly cut you off, but they're coming back. They can't stay away from you because you've got the answer for them. They can't stay away. But if you compromise, you've lost your witness. Okay, verse 6, James 4, 6. But he gives more grace. So we're not friends of the world. He gives more grace. So there's an area where we get more grace. We have it, but this more grace will, when we, we are not friends with the world, etc., this more grace, and Peter talks about grace and truth be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of Jesus. So the, what you have will start flowing out. If you're short on grace and peace, it's in you, but you don't have sufficient knowledge of Jesus and his finished works. Gives more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. He's not like standing there saying, King's X, you're proud. But it won't flow. You've put a stop on it. It says, humble yourself. He'll give more grace to the humble. So we'll see in the next verse, let's go to verse 7. And here we're instructed to do two things. And we're to do them both simultaneously, really. Submit yourself to God. And you can't submit yourself to God if you're not humble. So we saw in the previous verse, you have to humble yourself. You have to be humble. When you're humble, you're willing to submit to God. You're willing to submit to Jesus. You're willing to submit and do what the word says. Resist the devil and he will flee. So you're to humble yourself 
then submit and resist. Resist and submit. If you're not submitted to God, you don't, can try and resist the devil, but he will not flee. The devil's not going to listen to you and me. That's what, when these seven sons of Sceva came, they cast out, in the name of Jesus whom Paul serves. They says, Paul I know, Jesus I know, but who are you? Satan has to only know me by Jesus. And when I'm humbling myself and submitting unto God, I'm submitting to the word, I'm speaking the word, I'm walking in the word, then I've submitted to the word and I resist him and he flees. He flees because I've submitted. The two go together almost right away at the same time. You can't do one and then not the other. So we can't, because you're submitted to God, you resist the devil, he flees. But if you are submitted to God, you will resist the devil. If you're not resisting the devil, you're not submitted to God. He's telling us to resist the devil. He's telling us to submit. So as a person submitted to the word of God, I automatically resist the devil. So when the devil comes and puts a picture in my mind or shows me something or brings somebody across my path, when I'm submitted to God, I'll automatically resist that. And because I, in order I'm resisting the devil, I'm automatically res submitted to God. He's telling us to submit and resist. You can't say I'm submitted and then not resist the devil. Does that make sense? But see, we would like to think we're submitted to God and not resist the devil and allow ourselves to think crazy thoughts or do stupid stuff. Like David and I, you know, we could have spoken that word, submit to God, resist the devil. Well, we should have resisted that lust. You may as well call it what it was. Disobedience to the word. Well, we weren't obedient to the word because we didn't resist. I wish I could stand up here and say everything we ever did was totally on the word. It was just marvelous. Arlene, you're so great. Well, that's not right. I'm not. And totally missed it. The sad part is, this is really kind of sad. Both of us fell in the same ditch at the same time, so there wasn't one of us to pull the other out. Dumb to the nth degree. I mean, really compromise but you have to resist and submit and and resubmit and resist that is in the word many years ago we wanted when we first came into the baptism the holy spirit etc god what do you want us to do we wanted what ministry what this what's our gift we want to do we want to do and brother hagen said until you're obedient to the word and do what the word tells you to do, this has to be 45 years ago. Until you do what the word tells you to do, don't expect God to tell you anything else. If you won't listen to and do what's in his written word, why do you think he thinks you'll obey his spoken word? So we decided whatever we saw in the word we were going to do. And we were going to be debt free and owe no man anything. And God made a way and we sold our house at double the price, totally debt free, and then we fell in the ditch. We got help of Holy Spirit, we're out. But the point is, why will he tell us anything else to do if we won't listen to his word and do what it tells us to do? 
So humility is submission to God. Submission it, to God is humility. So if you want to know how to be humble, you're humble when you submit to God. So now, resist. Resist. What does it mean to resist? To resist means to actively fight against. This isn't a passive word. We must have a violent resolve to take advantage of the kingdom of God. The devil loves passiveness. When you realize what Jesus did for you and the price he paid and that he totally defeated Satan, and when you allow Satan access to your life on purpose, sometimes we don't know better, it's through ignorance, you're really spitting in Jesus' face. Now, we don't like to say it quite so harshly, but we're allowing Satan to have the upper hand in an area that he's already been defeated by Jesus. We have to realize Satan is totally, absolutely, totally, absolutely, absolutely, totally defeated by Jesus. And he can have no place in our life except what we give him. And if my life is a mess because of whatever I've done, and I cannot blame it on Satan, because if I actively fought against him with the word of God and resisted, I wouldn't be in that mess. Amen. And I don't particularly like that, but the truth will make you free. The truth set me free. It set me free. So now let's look at Matthew. I know I've got another one in there, but let's look at Matthew eleven fourteen. Matthew eleven fourteen. Jesus answered eleven fourteen. I apologize. Eleven fourteen. No, I did say eleven four. You know what? Just a minute. Guess I'll use my Bible. What a concept. Matthew. Maybe it is 11.4. No, that's not it. You know, whatever scripture I wanted, it is... 11, 12. 11, 12, please. Matthew 11, 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Now that relates to the scripture of resist, passively come against and stand for the kingdom of God, for God's rule in your life, you have to be violent, forceful with the word of God and not let circumstances and Satan run over you. The violent to take it by force. You have to make a quality decision and it has to be where you are not going to be passive. You have to make a decision, I am going to be violent against Satan. Because I'm going to have God's best in everything Jesus purchased for me. And that's not just going to come. Satan will try and stop it with everything he's got. And this violent Resolve. Active resistance is an ingredient that's missing in a lot of Christians' lives. Because it's easier to kick back and turn the TV on. You can watch Kenneth Copeland, Keith Moore, Andrew Womack, Charles Ka all of these people all day long. And you know what? 
the devil will sit right beside you and it won't change one iota of your situation. Until you become active with the word of God, the name of Jesus, speak the word, move in the word, submit to the word and resist the devil, nothing will change. Now all these teachers are great and they can show you where to go and find something. Brother um, Kenneth Hagen Jr., I know he doesn't go by Jr. anymore, but anyway, it was him. He said, look, I'm showing you where the gold mine is, but you have to go and dig it out and get the revelation yourself. That's what these te a teacher will do, but it doesn't give you revelation knowledge. Only Holy Spirit gives you revelation knowledge of the word. Yes, we're to listen. Yes, we're to do that. But there comes a time, you have to put your eyes on this word. You have to dig in it. You have to cross-reference scriptures. You have to speak it. You have to ask Holy Spirit for revelation. Holy Spirit, how do I apply this to my situation, to my life? What do you want me to do? You have to get to the place where I make a decision, I absolutely refuse to give any place to the devil. And I know nobody's doing it 100%, but as soon as we realize that we've missed it, but we absolutely have got to make that decision. I am not going to let Satan walk over me one more minute. When it doesn't line up to the word, and we've already seen that, Jesus doesn't change. When it doesn't line up to the word with what, it starts with a thought and with what I'm thinking, I will immediately look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith, and Holy Spirit, my comforter, will direct me where I should go. And that takes energy, it takes diligence, it takes, oh, I hate this word, self discipline and God's not going to do it for you but the minute you step in it he is there but he's not going to force you it's that book and I've talked about it the ladies did it the men did it and it's the power of imagination now who's ever done that book it's a good book. It's a good book. If you haven't done what that book told you to do, it was a waste of your time. It's a waste of your time. We're not doing these Bible studies and getting these books for you to sit there. Mind you, you have discussion and there's other things that help. But just to take it as a book and not do what it says to do. But it's very clear that what you're to do is get your imagination in line according to the word. And do the word. It is absolutely vitally important to make a decision that I refuse to allow Satan any place in my life. So we saw when you humble yourself, you submit. When you submit, You'll resist. If you're not resisting, you're not submitted to God. I don't like that either. Because sometimes it's work to labor to enter into the rest and finished works of Jesus. It takes effort. Sometimes these thoughts come, and you know what? To the flesh, they're kind of nice thoughts. But you know what? Every, almost every thought... I won't say every one, but almost every thought that doesn't line up with the word of God that we sit and think about and imagine are selfish. They're all about me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity. Check them out. And then my behavior following it is not what God wants me to do because I've opened the door to Satan. I've compromised. I've compromised. 
God never changes. Jesus doesn't change. And the power, God's power is in his word. It's the word of his power that holds everything together. The power of his word heals you. The power delivers you. The power gives you a sound mind. It's the word. So now we'll go um, to 2 Corinthians 11.3. But I fear, and we saw this one before, this is what happened in the garden. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. If you're deceived, beguiled there is deceived, when you're deceived, you'll be able to compromise. When you know the truth of God's word and refuse to move off of it, you won't compromise. You won't be concerned about what somebody says. If you're, you, you know. See, I don't believe for healing. I'm healed. Amen. That healing power is in my spirit. I just bring it forth. It's already there. Jesus purchased it for me. So I might not sound or look healed. And I'm not denying the mountain, that I, there's a mountain in my life. To deny it is foolish. But there could be a mountain in my life, but that mountain has no right to stay there, and I resist that mountain. It is an intruder in my life. That mountain is an intruder by Satan, and it has no right to be in my life. So somebody says something to me, so whatever... You know, I might, I don't know, look very ill, might sound ill. So they say, oh my, do you have the flu? No, I don't do flu. <laughs> Is it this? Is it that? No. Well, you sure sound like it. I know I sound like it, but according to my Lord and Savior, he bore it for me and I'm healed. Well, then religious people want that, that the world is one thing, but then the religious people want to criticize you and say, well, you're being foolish. What makes you think you're God's favorite, that you're going to be healed? No, I'm not going to be healed. I already am healed. Well, you might see that, but why do you think you're so special that you get that revelation? And there is, from believers from family, from whosoever will try and get you off of it. I have had more static from believers regarding walking in health than from the world. But I've had the world come to me and say, oh, Arlene, um, I've got this or that. When I was working, they'd go, I've got this or don't come too close. Oh, I go, that doesn't matter. The, everything dies when it comes in contact with me. They go, you know, that's right. You don't get sick, do you? I said, no, I don't do sick. So then they ask why, and you can tell them why. And they don't give me any static. I've gotten more static from believers. Compromised. Well, I don't want to say anything because they're sick, and they're a Christian, and I don't want to say this because then they're going to think, number one, it is more important for you and me to want to know what our Heavenly Father thinks and what my Lord and Savior thinks regarding my speech and what I say. Who am I trying to impress? God can't be impressed. So if I'm trying to impress somebody, we're back to selfish. I don't want to hurt their feelings. Well, I don't believe in going out and hurting people's feelings, but I do believe if they ask a question, they deserve the right answer according to the word of God. Amen. 
So, deception leads to compromise. And we'll end with this scripture today. Ephesians 6.11 Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil or the schemes of the devil. And the whole armor we know is a breastplate of righteousness, etc., etc. Well, he will question your righteousness. So you have to know that you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus in your spirit. But his wiles are deception. That's what he used on Eve, questioning God's word, trying to get Eve to believe God didn't say that, and ultimately trying to get you, well, she was going to be wise if she ate that. You can live your life without God. His whole purpose, he doesn't care about you and me. What he wants to do is get the word out of you. And every time you act contrary to the word, he has succeeded. He has gotten the word out of you. He knows the word is Jesus and he wants to destroy Jesus. But it won't work, so he does the body of Christ. But it's the word he's after because he knows once the word takes root, he's done. And he can no longer manifest through your life wrecking havoc. Should, then the world sees your mess, and then why should I be a Christian? Because look at the mess you've got, and I've got... Why should I want what you've, your God when you're in such a mess? His scheme is deception to get you to compromise, which Eve did. And you try and get... She wanted wisdom, but she wanted to get it without God. And when we humble ourselves under the hand of God, humble ourselves to the word of God, then we resist the devil. He flees because we're submitted. And he knows that. Zero compromise. Please stand.